OpenAI is a business entity consisting of a for-profit company called OpenAI LP and a non-profit umbrella entity called OpenAI Incorporated. And this is a research company primarily focused on different sorts of artificial intelligence approaches and applications, their ostensible goal being to benefit humanity with these sorts of technologies, which those involved consider to be some of the most important tools our species has ever created, with the capacity to change things on the same or greater scale as electrification and microprocessors. OpenAI is sustained primarily through pledges and investments, most notably from tech billionaires like Elon Musk and Sam Altman, but also from corporate entities like Microsoft. That abundance of support is partly cause, partly consequence of the incredible amount of stuff happening in the AI space these days. And to be clear, we're talking about focused, specific-purpose AI, not general-purpose AI, which is the kind that some people worry will become conscious and go all Terminator on the human race. These AI are more complex versions of code that we've been writing for ages, and in many cases, are only really special because of their scale and because of how they evolve over time, starting from a seedling and then iterating into something else, not because they're going to replace humans or take over the world. That latter point is important because although you can scale any type of code to make it more powerful, running it on fancier and fancier hardware and increasing the bandwidth it has available, even the most powerful code of that kind can only really do what its programmers tell it to do. AI of the kind that OpenAI and Google's DeepMind, which is a similar company, are working on, in contrast, are usually trained after they're programmed, which often means they're fed a bunch of data, and they use that data to glean insights into things, which in turn can make them more effective. This is how AI software like AlphaGo, which was built by DeepMind, got so good at playing the game Go, to the point where it can handedly beat the world's best human players pretty much every time now. It learned by playing thousands of matches against amateur and professional Go players, and a subsequent version of this AI, AlphaGo Zero, which was later consolidated into a new program called AlphaZero, learned by doing the same thing, but against itself. It was programmed with the basic rules of the game, rules that tell it, among other things, what victory looks like. And then it plays over and over and over again, over time developing strategies, which to it just look like algorithms, recipes that tend to result in success states from various non-success states. And that in turn leads to new AI-generated code that allows it to win almost always against humans. The same general principle applies to any other game AI attempt, from chess to video games like Pong and League of Legends, and other permutations of this approach allow new AI software to learn a game without even knowing the rules ahead of time. It learns the rules as it watches others play, or as it plays against itself, so it doesn't even need human players to play against in order to achieve world-dominating expertise anymore all of which is of a kind with other AI happenings, including DeepMind's recent extraordinary accomplishment in defining the three-dimensional folded structure of essentially every protein known to science, more than 200 million of them. Each single folded protein would previously have taken a human team an average of several years to define, a piece. And this AI called AlphaFold was able to churn out all of them, more than 200 million protein models, in less than a year. A gain in efficiency and effectiveness that was substantial enough that DeepMind was able to then release their entire database of all of these proteins to the public for free. And it used a similar approach to learning, to refining itself as its game-playing kin. Another big recent innovation in this space developed by OpenAI is the GPT, which stands for Generative Pre-Training Language Model, which is currently in its third iteration, GPT-3. The GPT model allows AI software to make predictions about language in such a way that it can come up with whole phrases, sentences, paragraphs, even books full of copy which typically make a good deal of sense because each word one by one is placed based on predictions predicated on huge libraries of text gleaned from books and websites and tweets and anything else they could gather together and feed into the library this software uses to teach itself how words should be placed. To be clear, 
just as AlphaGo doesn't understand that it's playing a game, or the significance of that game, and just as AlphaFold doesn't understand that it's folding proteins, which then allow us to understand a whole lot more about biology than we did before, the GPT model does not understand the words that it's stringing together. It just knows what words tend to follow which other words, where punctuation tends to go, and statistically, how everything should fit together and look at the end, depending on which language structure is requested by the user. The output of this kind of system can be almost frighteningly convincing as has been illustrated by entire articles on the subject of GPT written by the GPT system itself, based on just a few initial prompts, and has been illustrated by entire text-based video games like AI Dungeon, which have been built atop various GPT models. In the case of AI Dungeon, it is a text-based video game that is built on the fly by the GPT system as you play with no game the same as any other game, and every storyline and character and response perfectly unique to your individual experience. What I'd like to talk about today is another headline-grabbing use case for this type of AI technology that could have some serious ramifications, both positive and negative, for many industries, professionals, and mediums. <laughs> You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. It has been a tricky year for all news entities, so if you're in the position to do so, and if you're finding value in this or any news publication, please consider becoming a supporter. In the case of Let's Know Things, the simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also become a member at understandery.com and support this and all of my projects. Supporters who contribute monetarily via either method gain access to an ad-free version of this show and an additional episode of the show each month. A huge thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this podcast, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. <music> The article I'd like to start with today comes from Engadget, and it's entitled, Is Dali's Art Borrowed or Stolen? Dali, named after the surrealist artist Salvador Dali and the character Wally, is an AI model that can generate visual outputs based on natural language inputs. In practice, that means you can type in something like a giraffe falling off a skateboard, and Dali will spit out several visuals it has generated that aim to show what you described using language. And that's not an example that I just made up. That was an actual input that someone used before posting the image results to Twitter. And the output was kind of great. Many Dali visuals are just incredibly well-made, accurate, and even eerily realistic at times. And the outputs are getting better and better as people using various Dali models get better at phrasing their inputs in a way that make it more likely the model will translate your words as intended. Natural language, the way that humans speak and write it, can be tricky for computers to parse accurately. And just like there's code we can use to make our desires clearer to our software and how they operate and transmit information, so too is there a sort of natural language-based code speak developing that tends to lead to better, clearer, more accurate outcomes when utilizing things like DALI, but also things like voice assistance made by Amazon. DALI is what's called a generative pre-trained transformer model, which is similar to the aforementioned GPT language model, and in fact it is based on the same general system. But rather than outputting language based on the user's input, it outputs pixels. It figures out where to put and how to arrange those pixels by using what's called a contrastive language image pre-training model, which basically means that it was fed 400 million images scraped from the internet, each one paired with caption-like metadata describing what is in the images. And this system, which is usually acronymed as CLIP, figures out which images from a subset of this sprawling library are related to the text it was given as an input, and then combines them in ways that make sense according to the criteria also derived from that dataset. Here is how things tend to look in images with metadata related to the input I was provided. 
So if I were to write something like a frog celebrating Christmas as a prompt, Dali would search the captions attached to those hundreds of millions of images, select relevant ones, combine elements from those images, and combine them in a huge number of ways, and then select images from that huge jumble of new collages that it's made based on which ones seem most clear and with the best composition and with a style that best matches that of any style prompts the user might have requested. It's selecting from a huge library of things that it has made for the ones that will make the most sense to the humans that it is doing this work for. All of that said, as impressive as many of this model's outputs can be, it's currently limited in that it requires a lot of processing power to run, and in that many versions, including the Real Deal Dali 2, but also alternative versions, of which there are many, including several based on an entirely new language model alternative to GPT called Bloom, as well as others based on DeepMind's Lambda, which is also similar, these different versions of this concept have more or less issues than others, tend to output certain types of images better or worse than the others. It's a pretty mixed bag at the moment. And depending on which system you use and what type of image output you're expecting, you may be pretty disappointed because many of the most widely available of these systems at the moment are not as powerful or not as informed by a huge collection of libraries, or not as useful because of the way that they parse those images as the real deal Dali 2 model. Perhaps most importantly and fundamentally though, systems of this kind base the visuals they create on existing visuals with captions. And that can introduce bias into all of these systems. And already it's been noted that Dali outputs more images of men than women. It has weird imbalances with race, and it often makes use of stereotypes of all kinds because it's deriving meaning from those hundreds of millions of internet scraped images. It doesn't know what it is showing. It is placing pixels in the same way that a GPT model places words, based on statistical models that allow it to predict what should come next, based on the frequency of such placements in that library of words it's ingested. So common biases and stereotypes are part and parcel for this type of output generating approach because biases and stereotypes are so abundant in that source material. The folks behind DALI have done their best to counter this and have placed filters on language and visual output to prevent the creation of, for instance, sexual or violent content. These filters, like any filters, are imperfect but they've apparently also created new biases. It's suspected that the aforementioned imbalance between men and women in newly generated images, when gender is not specified by the user, may be because a lot of images of women on the internet feature some kind of sexualization or violence, and they are thus filtered out of the model, skewing the available image library in favor of people who look like stereotypical men, and thus the statistical likelihood that any given person in an image generated will look like a man is increased. That's one bundle of concerns about DALI and similar models amongst people who worry about such things. Another is that because these visual generating systems are getting so good so fast, and they really are impressive, despite all those caveats. If you haven't seen any of the recent stuff that's been created by Dolly 2 in particular, it's worth your time to do some Googling. And like me, you may not believe at first that some of the images were created in this way as they're just so good. But because this field is moving so fast and getting to be of such a high quality, there are concerns in the graphic design and fine art world in particular, that soon some of their work might be done by this type of system. Which again, if you've seen some of the work that is created by these models, it may seem like a real issue. It's likely that some jobs could be done faster and cheaper, and even in some cases, better by this type of program, which could save companies a lot of money too, as they might pay a small monthly fee for access to this AI and to own the rights to whatever Dali outputs for them, while folks who might have previously bought work from an artist to decorate their walls might instead buy cheap outputs from Dali 2 or similar systems and just frame those. This is a concern for writers too. That GPT language model I mentioned before is already being used by some companies to generate copy for their websites and for other marketing materials. And there have also been entire books and songs and other such content written by these types of systems. 
There are implications here for copyright and royalties, as, again, you might pay for access to this type of model, but what the AI spits out, even if you have a license to it, is generated by ingesting a bunch of other work, which could theoretically put it in the same category as a digital collage. And at times you might recognize those outside influences, and other times it will be completely invisible, but this still may be a copyright concern in some cases, especially when someone else's intellectual property like a cartoon character, Mickey Mouse, for instance, is included in the image that is output. It may be remixed, but it may not be remixed enough to avoid getting you sued for infringement. The very content library that makes these models so powerful, then, could also make them so legally complicated and questionable that some of their practical utility disappears. That's the focus of the Engadget article, actually. At what point does this auto-generating mimicking become plagiarism? It's hard to say. And most of the speculation on this matter at this moment remains just speculation, as no legal cases have gone to trial yet to draw any clean lines around what's okay and what's not. That said, there are also already people using these AI to create cyborg-centaur relationships. In the context of competitive chess, a centaur player is a chess-playing human who uses software including AI models, to help them generate potential moves and make recommendations. The human is the final judge of how to proceed, but the AI aids them in their decision-making process, helping them think asymmetrically or more broadly, providing additional functionality while leaving the rider, the chess player, in control, like a human on a horse or a human with a horse body, a centaur. There are already professional writers using GPT for similar purposes, entering characters or storyline information into the model and allowing it to spit out ideas about where the narrative could go, twists and turns they could integrate into the storyline, ways to describe a character in a tricky context without just saying the same things over and over again, and other such work that can then inform how the writer does their job, but which does not replace the writer. It's thought that those who embrace these sorts of technologies might have a leg up on those who do not, because despite their many flaws, these AI can do a lot of heavy lifting, especially when it comes to comparably tedious, boring aspects of a job or big picture stuff that can then benefit from a bunch of alternative ideas that are then soaked up and utilized by the human eye, brain, and sensibility, which then refines and finishes it. Interestingly, we might also see this same dynamic play out in the world of code, of developing software, as services like Copilot allow coders to tell the system what they want to build, and an AI predicated on this same general theory will then write up a bunch of code for them, in some cases nailing it right away, so they don't have to do anything except imagine what they want and describe it to the computer, and in other cases doing a lot of the heavy lifting, which then allows the coder to spend their time customizing and refining the details of that broad-based output, rather than slogging through the basics and wasting a whole lot of billable hours on fundamental stuff. Rather than being an example of the machines coming for our jobs then, these types of models could, if they keep evolving the way they are at least, become tools in the tool belts of people working these jobs, which could allow them to spend more time on creative and detail-oriented aspects of their work rather than comparable drudgery and low-impact tedious components of their professions. Much of the conversation, and the published takes in particular, focused on these AI at the moment, seem to come down on the side of either blind optimism or blind pessimism. These AI will either save us and change the world for the better, or will destroy everything we've built in a heartbeat. Based on what we've got now, at least, and where the technology seems to be going, it may be a better bet that we'll get a bit of both. Lots of professional weirdness and discomfort, some people put out of work, maybe some existing issues within various professions amplified, and some new issues created as well. But also solutions to existing issues, the augmentation of the capabilities of skilled workers, and the creation of entirely new, valuable types of work. And there's a bit of an arms race happening in this space at the moment, with new services and tools emerging seemingly daily. You can now use this tech to make edits to existing images by explaining, in normal language, what you want the AI to change about an image you submit. You can ask the software for different iterations of something it outputs with minor adjustments. You can create your own back-of-the-napkin style sketch and then upload that image and have the AI turn it into something professional looking. It's all happening very fast, and it really does seem like these offerings are becoming more sophisticated and practical 
every single day. Considering all these new applications then, a lot of today's concerns about these technologies may be similar to the complaints and concerns we saw when Photoshop was first released. The design world was worried, perhaps justifiably, that all the design jobs would go away because suddenly anyone with a computer and a mouse could use this software to do design digitally. What actually happened is designers became more powerful. They took on more responsibilities and their roles did change, and some specialties like typesetting and photo retouching merged into the larger designer moniker, that whole professional package. Every designer had to do a bunch of new things. But the career and the profession itself did not disappear. It may be that in many of these cases, the same thing will happen. And instead of designers and writers and podcast hosts and musicians and video makers and coders disappearing, we will instead see automation-related responsibilities melded into their larger skill set, all of them becoming more capable, but also then responsible for more things because they are able to do those things relatively easily. There are longer-term, deeper-level issues that may eventually become a real problem here, though. Like what happens when these systems start using content they've created, or words and visuals created by other such models, alongside or instead of those made by humans? A bit like AlphaGo training by competing against itself, but in this case, some visual-making AI absorbing a bunch of writing and images made by other AI, which it then uses to decide which images to make next. What happens to our media when much of it is created by a mesh of such mechanisms, simply copying each other, endlessly remixing each other? How do we value truly original work over remixed collaged work of this kind as these technologies evolve, hopefully in such a way that we incentivize the continued creation of truly original work? And how much will the peculiarities of such systems, their ways of visualizing things, their ways of turning a phrase, how much will those adjustments to the way humans typically do things reshape and influence how we write and speak and create and even envision certain concepts? our archetypes, our stereotypes, our biases. Right now, I think it's possible to be impressed by the superficial applications of these tools and their potential deep use cases as well, while also remaining skeptical about what they mean and where they might go next and who they serve and the ultimate ambitions of the entities backing them. <laughs> If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also support this and all of my work all at once by becoming a member at understandery.com. Folks who contribute via either of these methods receive an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show as a thank you. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show. You make these weekly episodes possible, and I'm truly grateful for that. And thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, The Triumphant Turbulent Stories Behind How Video Games Are Made by Jason Schreier. This is a book that's actually relevant to the topic of today's episode, as video game making is a field that is incredibly cumbersome and requires so much work and resources and time and energy and blood and sweat and tears, all of it. And some of the stories of this industry are really inspiring at times, but also borderline depressing at times because of all the moving pieces and sacrifices those involved have to make. And I can't help but think the early examples of AI applied to this field, as is the case with AI Dungeon, but also other visual-based video games that I've seen already that have been made by these systems. I feel like those AI could help a lot with some of the heavy lifting that needs to be done in these spaces. If nothing else, the generation of just the obscene amount of graphical details that need to be made for each and every game could probably be shortcutted a bit using some of these systems. But all that said, this is an interesting book if you are into video games and you're curious about how some of the big ones or important ones or well-known ones and some of the small ones came to be and all the politicking and work and technical stuff that had to happen for those to actually arrive on shelves. 
digital and physical. But it's also interesting, I think, if you don't know what goes into video games, and it might even be kind of surprising if your conception of video games is kind of a niche thing that kids play or productions by relatively small teams. These are things that are actually made by teams that are at times as large or larger, wielding budgets that are as large or larger compared to massive Hollywood blockbuster films. And so getting to see some of the moving pieces underneath that was pretty interesting to me and might be interesting to you as well. And if any of that does sound interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Blood, Sweat, and Pixels by Jason Schreier. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find a portfolio of my other projects, including my other podcasts, at understandery.com. And my newest project, which is focused on climate-related news, can be found and subscribed to for free at climatehappenings.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I am Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram and such. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.